And uh, like our last breakfast briefing, it's on a, on a pretty important topic uh, related to wildlife conservation. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Uh, for the sportsman's community to be caring about wildlife conservation. Uh, I think those of us that are sportsmen and women all, all remember that it is the sportsmen and women that pay for wildlife conservation in, in the United States and that uh, this is an opportunity to look at how we're going to address that growing um, issue of, of more species of concern, uh, more users that are that are taking advantage of our great outdoors, and a fairly finite amount of money that's available right now. So uh, we've got a, a great program uh, with members of Congress and, and uh, some other invited guests. Uh, but as we always do, um, we want to welcome you here, and, and I want to invite Congressman Rob Whitman, who is the Republican Chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Sportsman's Caucus. Excuse me. Uh, he is from Virginia and has a district where he can go out and feed his dogs in the morning and listen to the gobblers fire right. off That's right. and think about Saturday and That's trying right. to get after them. So uh, pretty jealous about that. So please welcome from First District of uh, Virginia, Congressman Rob Whitman. Thanks, Jeff, and good morning. Thank you all so much for coming out. What an important morning. You know, we have lots of challenges out there and what we do to make sure that we can all enjoy the natural resources uh, that have been bestowed upon us. It's our job, I believe, to make sure that we sustain and preserve those resources and make sure, too, that a variety of different people have access to them. And we all know, as sportsmen and women, how we love of those natural resources but the key is is how do we make sure we sustain those natural resources for the future and make sure too that we have those connecting points for people you know there's nothing worse than seeing something you'd like to enjoy but but you can't get to it or you can't access it so I think having a discussion and putting it putting together this blue ribbon, ribbon panel on sustaining uh, America's diverse fish and wildlife resources is critical it's it's a great way for us to get out in front of what we know could be an issue of prices proportions if we don't really get our arms around it. So this is a great proactive way for us to do it. You'll hear a lot of great ideas about how we make those things happen and what the course could be for legislation and congressional action in the months to come. So I appreciate everybody being here today. Thanks for what you do to support the caucus and the foundation. Uh, those two organizations uh, work very closely with each other and our focus is on our natural resources, our fish and wildlife resources, and making sure that they continue for generations to come, but make sure that we all have access to enjoy those resources. So Jeff, thanks again for your leadership, and we look forward to our speakers this morning to learn more about what we can do to make sure we ensure a great future for those resources. Thanks again. Thank you, Congressman. And before I invite our, our first speaker up here, I do want to uh, First, thank the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies for co-hosting this breakfast, so please join me in giving them a round of applause. One of our board members is here, Larry Keene from the National Shooting Sports Foundation. Thank you, Larry. And there are a few members of Congress. Uh, we're going to introduce Congresswoman Dingle in just a second, but uh, Congressman Whitman's here, Congressman Garrett Graves, Congressman Bob Latta, uh, Congressman French Hill, and Congressman Crescent Hardy, please just thank them for taking time to join us. And hopefully I haven't missed any, any, uh, any of our members of the Sportsman's Caucus. Uh, our first speaker this morning, uh, while she is a freshman member of the House of Representatives, she is no stranger to, uh, to the House, uh, and she is no stranger to wildlife conservation and, and hunting and fishing. Congressman Dingle represents the 12th district uh, um, Michigan. Uh, she was previously the chair of the Wayne State University Board of Governors. She's been an active civic and community leader uh, as a, and recognized as a national advocate for women and children. Uh, for more than 30 years she served as one of Michigan's largest employers, the General Motors Corporation, where she was president of the GM Foundation and a senior executive. I'm not going to read it all, I promise. I just want to just want to highlight it. So uh, I think a lot of folks also know that her husband, John Dingle, was the longest serving member of the United States Congress, uh, former chair of the 
bipartisan Congressional Sportsman's Caucus uh, and a pretty good shot because I've shot with him before and he can hit a lot of targets, I assure you. So please welcome uh, from Michigan, Congresswoman Debbie Ding. Oops, I'm shorter than many of you, so good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And I want to tell you first of all how good it is to be with all of you. I, I have to say that um, I, I am here probably because of my 35 year marriage to John Dingle and what that marriage uh, has meant to having to fight hard to preserve all the things that you care about. What he really does need is the good skeet shoot. He doesn't shoot as well as he needs but his mood is such right now that he needs a good whiff of of something. Either go take him turkey hunting or I keep saying he's just got to get out there to get him in a better mood. But uh, uh, Jeff, thanks for that kind introduction and I want to thank um, Bob Whitman, Rob Whitman for his leadership uh, of the Sportsman's Caucus and it is so very important. I mean we talk about the hunting aspect or the shooting aspect of it. I grew up uh, not at the same time as John Dingle actually but in Michigan in the outdoors I was a fisher and I, I was a fisherwoman. I mean, we didn't talk about it that way. But I grew up in the St. Clair River, and if you were still to ask me what my favorite thing and what I greatly want to escape to do was to get in that inner tube and float down the river in the wake of the freighters. So the waves were the best, and you'd kill your kids if you ever did what we did. But it really is what we're trying to preserve and what's so important about it. So I want to thank my two friends, Colin has, um, I saw him come in, there he is, over there, and who's for the National Wildlife Federation, and you all know, and Jeff Crane, who has already talked this morning, for all of their leadership on the Blue Ribbon Panel. And this Blue Ribbon Panel really, really, really matters, because we do need to make sure that we are preserving the great outdoors and are preserving our natural resources. I mean, we all, young people today don't talk to each other. We already know that um, the, all they do is text, etc. They kind of get outdoors. We've got to preserve our great natural resources and get them to understand how lucky we are and to preserve these great spaces and to make sure people can do what so many in this room grew up doing and still do. So the Blue Ribbon Panel on Sustaining America's Diverse Fish and Wildlife Resources is the type of big, bold and audacious project that we need to have a modern conservation policy for the 21st century. It's so important because the states, and it, what it does is recognize and empowers the states because they are on the front lines of conservation for our nation's wildlife. And it's critical that we provide resources for them to prevent wildlife from becoming endangered. That's something that we all share. The Blue Ribbons Panel's proposal for a $1.3 billion dedicated to the funding stream for the Wildlife Conservation Restoration Program will help promote conservation and species protection so that future generations can enjoy them. And it will ultimately help get more people outdoors, from hunters and anglers to bird watchers, and quite frankly, even backyard gardeners who love birds and butterflies. So I'm very pleased that this idea builds, uh, uh, builds off of successes of Pittman, Robertson, and Dingle Johnson. Now that may, may be familiar to you, and I'm, I will be blunt with you, I had never heard of Dingle Johnson until I became a member of Congress. <laughs> so okay, what do I know? But then when I became a member of Congress, I thought, okay, this was one more thing that John Dingle did in the 60s, which most people don't know how much of this, you know, what's interesting is to see that so many things that you all take for granted. He did when he had this, he tells the story. Some of you younger, the younger people here haven't heard it and those that have been hunting with him have heard it. Uh, he had this little committee that he did all of these things to protect conservation and you know when he uh, first introduced the Clean Water Act, he was widely condemned from one end of this country to the other which I found in all these clips when he, everybody was so afraid of it. But the, the Dingle Johnsonville was actually named for his father. So it shows you that this importance of conservation has gone on for decades. So, but obviously it's personal for me because I have a responsibility to, I have a moral responsibility to preserve the outdoors and I feel a 
John Deagle will never, ever forgive me if I don't deliver. So I go home every night and he grills me, and that is not a joke. So my husband and Don Young spearheaded a similar proposal in the 1990s to get more funding back to the states. It was very complicated. We all know how things break down. Now is the time after this blue ribbon panel to finish the job and to get this over the line. So Don, I've talked to Don Young. We've had many, and many people in this room have had many conversations. He has an interest in this new recommendation from the Blue Ribbon Panel, and we are going to work together. Yes, there is bipartisanship in this Congress. We are going to have the Don Young Debbie Dingle team to try to make this idea a reality. We know it'll take time. We know it's a big lift. But thanks to the work of the Blue Ribbon Panel, we have a big ten of supporters including teaming with the Wildlife Coalition and more than 6,400 other organizations ranging from large and small, sportsmen's groups to businesses like Bass Pro Shop and Shell Oil. Those are not bad names. We have groups with a lot of history on this issue like the National Wildlife Federation, you'll hear more about that, bird groups like the Audubon, and many, many more. And if we want to make this happen, we all got to work together. And you know, we can do that. There's still the power of people coming together from 50 states, from diverse regions and countries, when you have a vision and you know what's the right thing to do, we can make it happen. We have to make this happen. We have to preserve the outdoors that we all love. So you'll soon start hearing from people in your states. In Michigan alone, I've got 100 groups lined up to support including the Michigan United Conservation Clubs, who've got a long history of seeking funding for state wildlife agencies. So you're going to hear more from everybody here today. We owe this to our grandchildren. We owe it to our future generations. You all are able to do what you do today because the people that came before you were borrowing this land for future generations. Let's make sure that all those experiences that put you in a room at 8.15 on a Wednesday morning when you'd rather be someplace else, but, but because you care, let's make sure that we can pass that on to future generations. Thank you very much. I think we can all agree we've got a passionate champion there. Thank you, Congresswoman. And uh, we look forward to getting the bill finalized and dropped here as soon as possible. And you and the congressmen are ready to go. We are, we're going to be right there with you. So thank you for being, joining us this morning. All right, so to give us a little bit more history on how, we're, how we got to here, uh, what the Blue Ribbon Panel is, because I'm not sure everybody in the room does know what that is, um, we have with us today Dave Chanda who is the president of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, and he's also the director of the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, Dave's an accredited wildlife biologist. He's got a master's in public administration, uh, and he's been wor working in the field of wildlife management for more than 35 years. Uh, I can go on. He's got another long bio with a lot of accred accreditations. How do I say that? I don't Whatever, you know what I mean. On, uh, and he is, as I say, currently the president of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. Came down from New Jersey. Please welcome Dave Chanda. Well, thank you, Jeff, and thank you, uh, Congresswoman Dingle, for those exciting words and inspirational words. We really appreciate it. Uh, as, uh, as was said, I'm the director of New Jersey Fish and Wildlife. I've been with the agency for 36 years. Um, been the director for 11 years, it feels like 100, but uh, you know, we do some really good things in New Jersey. And I'd love to spend some time, but that's not what it's all about today. Who would think the most densely populated state in the nation has a tremendous fish and wildlife resource? I do want to acknowledge some of the Blue Ribbon panel members that are, that are in the audience today, uh, you know, before I even go into some of my remarks. And, uh, of course, our host, uh, Jeff Crane, uh, who's the president of the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation, sat on that panel. Uh, Margaret O'Gorman right here, the president of Wildlife Habitat Council. Uh, I know I saw him, Glenn Olson with National Audubon in the back right. And of course, you're gonna hear from Colin O'Mara, the president and CEO of the National uh, Wildlife Federation, uh, are the panel members that we have here. And thank you folks for taking some time uh, to come out today. 
Uh, I'm going to actually take a little bit of a step back and, and, and talk about some of the history first. I, I think as I look around the room, I'm probably talking to the choir, but I, I'm going to do it anyway, you know, because, you know, there's not a country in the world that has done the work and protected and conserved the natural resources as this country has. Now, does that mean there's not room for improvement? Of course, we can do a much better job. But as I travel around and you look at the North American model for wildlife management, wildlife conservation, it still sets the bar for what other countries aspire to do. And, and that model you know, is based upon a user pay, user benefit system, and it's worked really well. And that has not always been the way. I mean, we all know 100 years ago, there were a lot of wildlife species in jeopardy, populations were on the decline, and as a result of that, the sporting public stepped up and, and agreed to pay a hunting license as long as that money went into conserving fish and wildlife. And then in 1937, you had Senator Key Pittman, Congressman, Congressman Willis Robertson led the way on an excise tax on arms and ammunition that was dedicated strictly for the conservation of, of wildlife, particular game species. And, and that, that, uh, that act was supported by both the industry and the sporting public. They recognized that that was money that was essential to do the job. And what were the results? Well, let's see, white-tailed deer, which were on the brink, rebounded to historic numbers. Elk, uh, wood duck, wild turkey, black bear, all of the species that states now have the resources to manage made, made just tremendous comebacks. You move into the 50s, and that's when you saw, you know, Senator Johnson and Congressman Dingell Sr. pass the, uh, the Dingle Johnson Act. Same thing for game fish, same results. Finally, resources to do the job, and you saw just a, a tremendous uh, you know, surge of species that were coming back and habitat work that we were able to do. So I think time and time again, the country's demonstrated the ability to step up to some of these tough problems, like the problem that we're facing today. Um, you know, but the one area that we've never succeeded is how do you manage or how do you secure funding to manage all of those other species that we have a responsibility to manage? And the one thing that, that uh, does exist out there is every state in this country, you know, has a plan to accomplish just that. They're called state wildlife action plans. And these are mechanisms that are aimed at keeping a common species common, to prevent species from heading to the road of a federal threatened or an endangered species listing. These plans were mandated by Congress, and it was uh, you know, a, a great accomplishment to make all the states develop these plans. We had to develop those plans to make us eligible for state wildlife uh, action grant plant money. Uh, they provide the roadmap for what we need to do. They, they you know, are showing us the way the problem is that we have very limited resources and we've only be able, been able to uh, address a small fraction of the wildlife that's contained in those wildlife action plans. I think as we heard Congresswoman Dingle speak, we now have an opportunity to, to, to take that next step and, and manage these species. Um, and that's the goal of all of this because nobody wants to see a species slide off the, the radar to the point that it gets listed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is either endangered or threatened. The minute that happens, it's problems for everybody. It costs the feds more money to manage that species, it costs the states more money to manage that species, and it's tougher on industry to do their job in and around the area that that species exists. So if we can, if we can address that, if we can keep those from happening, it's clearly going to be good for not only the wildlife, but the economy that, that we're all so interested in dealing with. And it was this threat, it was this looming crisis that led to the creation of the Blue Ribbon Panel. Um, you all have uh, the report on your chair. If you'd like the full report, it is on the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies website. Uh, you can just go to fishwildlife.org. But the Blue Ribbon Panel was co-chaired by John Mars, who was the founder and uh, owner of Bass Pro Shops, and Dave Friedenthal, former governor from Wyoming. So you had two huge champions that helped lead the way on this. The panel members, you know, to me represent the proverbial who's who of the business industry, energy extraction, and the conservation community. Uh, you know, some, some very smart people, uh, you know, very creative thinkers, 
and uh, you know they took it as uh, their task to how are we going to avert this looming crisis of how do we sustain America's fish and wildlife. Over the past year, the Blue Room Panel has conducted three meetings and they've held listening sessions where they invited the public to come in and tell them what they think. What do they see as the problems? What do they see as the solutions? And at the end of the day, and they examined all of the potential areas where we could uh, you know, address and work toward this problem, you know, they came out with a couple of recommendations in the report, and the one that I'll speak to is the primary recommendation was that Congress take $1.3 billion uh, annually in existing revenue from the development of energy and mineral resources on federal lands and waters and place it in the Wildlife Conservation Restoration Program. Now, you might say, why $1.3 billion? Why not $5 billion? Why not $500 million? Where, where did the number come from? Well, in 2012, the Southwick Associates reached out to every state fish and wildlife agency, and the question was, how much is it going to cost you annually to implement the state wildlife action plan that you were charged by Congress to develop? And as you can imagine, it was a big number. And the $1.3 billion represents what would be 75% of the cost to implement the state wildlife action plans that exist around the country. And I, and I think that's a doable goal. I think you will see some tremendous success if, if we are able to get there. So for the first time in history, you know, we have an opportunity before us to proactively manage fish and wildlife, to keep those common species common, and just like Pittman Robertson, just like Dingle Johnson, uh, you know, we have the ability, we have the opportunity in front of us to demonstrate <coughs> that we're up to the challenge and we're up to the task to make this happen. And, and, and I will tell you, it can happen when you have the resources available, when you have the professionals available, when you have the, the NGOs out there working side by side with you and all of the volunteers to do the work, you can do the job. I mentioned I'm from the state of New Jersey, the most densely populated state in the nation. 36 years ago when I started my career, we had one nesting pair of bald eagles in our entire state. Do you know how hard it is to protect and manage one pair of anything in your state to make sure that it doesn't flash out of existence? And who would ever have thought that New Jersey could do something about it? Well, we did. We invested some time and resources into managing bald eagles. We worked with Canada to bring some young eagles down and raise them in, in uh, what are called hacking towers, release them into the wild with the hopes that they would come back to New Jersey and set up shop. And guess what they did? It didn't happen overnight. It took 30 plus years, but New Jersey now has 190 nesting pairs of bald eagles. Who would have ever thought the most densely populated state in the nation could bring a species like that back to those kind of numbers? And it just demonstrates what you can do when you have the resources to do it. But it didn't come cheaply. My entire annual operating budget is $25 million. And I'll bet you over the past 35 years, we have probably spent $25 million trying to bring that eagle back. And, and, and there were no funding sources. That was done with bake sales, with uh, begging for donations, with corporations stepping up to the plate and giving us money. We cobbled those budgets together to make it happen, but happen it did. And, and I can tell you when it comes to managing a species, it's a lot easier on all of us, the agency, the industry, the people that live in the area, when you've got 190 pairs of something versus one pair of something. So, you know, it can be done. I think that you know those success stories aren't just great for wildlife, but and it wasn't just great for the eagle. You know, it, it's great for all of us when uh, when we're able to, to do that kind of thing. So you know, the, the panel has done a tremendous job. They've set the table for us. It's great that you folks have hosted this breakfast for us to come together and have a have a little conversation about the opportunity that's in front of us. And the congresswoman did say it's not about us. Let's do this for our kids, for our grandkids, and for those future generations that are going to come. And I hope that together we can all make that happen. So thank you folks for joining us today. I really appreciate the top time and the opportunity to speak with you. And Jeff, thanks for this opportunity. Dave, Dave mentioned is, a, is also a member of our Blue Ribbon panel. And uh, before, I, before I read a couple things off of his bio, uh, when we were on the panel, Governor Frudenthal and Johnny Morris asked me, actually they didn't, he didn't ask me, 
he informed me that I was going to take on the role of being in charge of the legislative policy uh, for the Blue Ribbon Panel. Uh, and being a person that realizes that's a pretty big lift for one guy, I immediately went and recruited Colin to help me out on it, and he said yes. I think I actually asked you. I didn't inform you as uh, the governor kind of did to me. So uh, thanks, for, thanks for saying yes, Colin. So Colin O'Mara. Uh, is the president and CEO of the National Wildlife Federation, uh, which is America's largest conservation organization. Uh, under his leadership, the National Wildlife Federation is protecting wildlife ranging from bison to monarch butterflies, uh, ensuring healthy waters and sustainable habitats, advancing environmental education, and connecting people with the great outdoors. Um, he comes from the state of Delaware, where uh, he served as the Secretary of Natural Resources and Environmental Control, and in 2009, when he took that position over, he was the youngest cabinet secretary of anybody in the United States. So uh, he's accomplished a whole lot as a young guy, and uh, I'm glad, as I said, to have him be my co-lead in terms of the environmental and, and policy side of things. Colin, welcome. Thanks, Jeff, and I actually love working with, with Jeff Green. Um, let me start by thanking First Congressman Green and all of your members um, for the incredible work that you've all done on the Bipartisan Sportsman Bill. Um, watching the sportsman voice get stronger and stronger under with the leadership of the Congressional Sportsman Foundation is actually really exciting. And frankly, I think it's perfect that we're posting this kickoff here at the Hill at one of Jeff's breakfasts. Because right now, we, we, do have a, we do have a bit of a crisis. I mean, a lot of you have had members, have had constituents in your office complaining about various challenges with the Endangered Species Act. Right now, of the 20,000 species in the U.S. that are most common, one-third are vulnerable in some way. One-third of all those species. And so in the last budget cycle, there were a lot of amendments and riders and things like that related to individual, individual species. Now, the challenge is that the reason you're seeing all those, all those challenges on the landscape is that we haven't invested in wildlife conservation in a long way. There's a very simple way to actually restore species in this country. And it's to give states and local communities the resources they need to do proactive, upfront conservation early in the process rather than waiting till it's at an emergency room crisis point on the back end. Because at that point, it's really expensive and the regulations get really tight. And that's what you guys see when folks are coming into your offices asking your member to you know, consider different amendments. And so my, my question for kind of everyone to think about is, what if there was a better way? What if there was a way to actually have more resources going to the states so they can do proactive conservation on the front end so at the, at the point where we can bring folks together, bring landowners and businesses and things together, do collaborative, voluntary, proactive measures on the front end, as opposed to having more expensive federal measures at the very back end. And if we can shift this paradigm, all of a sudden now you're not going to see the contentious lit litigation. You're going to see much more conservation on the ground, because we know that when conservation is local, as a former state guy, when those, <laughs> the states are good at this stuff. You know, David had one example of bald eagles. If you're in Montana, we could talk about graylings. From the Northeast, we could talk about, we could talk about um, cottontails. There's all these species that we've brought back across the country, white tail, like the deer populations, and we've done it with species when there's some resources. And so when your members are saying, you know, what was that breakfast about this morning? You know, what, what's, what's Jeff up to now? Saying, we're trying to figure out a way to save species in a way that also creates more business certainty. And so the proposal that you'll see, yes, it's got a price tag on it. You know, $1.3 billion, but that's spread over all 50 states and territories. And so if you actually kind of look at it across, it's actually a pretty cheap price to pay for the regulatory certain and regulatory certainty that you're going to get. You know, 80 years ago, next year, in Congress, you know, many of the, uh, the many of your predecessors worked together with sportsmen leading the charge to have to bring Pittman Robertson Act for dedicated funding for wildlife conservation. It was focused on birds and mammals. It was focused mainly on game species. And because of that, all of us can go out now, hunt ducks, hunt deer, hunt elk. All these species that were in trouble 80 years ago are thriving now because of that. We can do the same thing for the rest of the species in a way that's fiscally conservative, that empowers the states, that has less federal involvement, and in a way that really does kind of leave the next legacy. As Debbie Dingell was saying a few minutes ago, the combination of the Pittman-Robertson Act for game, for game species, basically, for big mammals and birds, with the sport fish funding, has taken care of two-thirds of the, kind of the triangle, if you will. That last piece, though, is this piece that we're talking about for the full wildlife diversity. So if we can figure out a way to kind of get, the, get this passed and get these resources in the hands of the state, we can conserve thousands of species that won't need any kind of federal protections. 
you know, and I imagine the legacy. So, I mean, you know, thinking about all your bosses that have been standing up, working on the bipartisan sportsman bill, working on different conservation programs, there is no greater legacy than the fact that we all talk about Pippin Robertson with such reverence 80 years later shows that these are things that people remember. These are things that matter, right? So when your members retire 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now, these are the kind of things that actually get, these are the things that are historic. These are the things that actually make a, make a huge difference. In addition to the benefits on the species side and kind of reducing the, the regulatory uncertainty from the Endangered Species Act, the other thing that this bill will do is create a boon in the, in, in the outdoor industry economy. Right now, the outdoor industry economy is about a $646 billion economy in our country. So, you know, a lot of folks think about the time they spend, you know, going to Bass Pro Shops or other stores getting their gear or, you know, kind of going out camping or hunting or getting a blind or a, or a deer stand. You know, that's a huge industry in this country. Now, the challenge if we don't protect these resources, that industry is going to continue to diminish. This is why Jeff works so hard on access issues. This is why it's so important that we maintain our, our, maintain our, our lands and, ma and manage them better. But if we can figure out ways to actually invest in species in collaborative ways, those experiences get better and better. Folks are going to have more. Folks are going to spend more money. Folks are going to make more money. You'll see more businesses. So, from a regulatory point of view, this is a home run. From a business point of view, this is a home run. From a conservationist point of view, any of you that have been out, you not know, kind of enjoying the great outdoors, you know, you can imagine what it'd be like if there's that much, much more wildlife around. Um, what enhancement of that experience there would be. So, on all those fronts, this is a home run. And if we know this ounce of prevention is going to prevent a pound of cure later, we almost be foolish not to take this opportunity. So it's not, it's not going to be easy, I and mean, we're going to need everyone your help, but I do hope you'll go back to your members today, and I hope Congressman Green will join us too, um, and be sponsors of this legislation. We'll have language you know, soon, but I mean, I, it would be wonderful if every single sponsor on the Bipartisan Sportsman Bill was also a sponsor of this. We're going to do work on the Senate in the same way. We need your help, because this is one of those things that we can leave a legacy that conservation from generation to be looking back, you know what? Even though the politics were tough in Washington in 2016, 2020, 2017, you know, they were able to get this done. And it's no different than in 1937 at the depths of the depression, right? I mean, imagine how bad the politics were when unemployment was still massively in double digits, trying to figure out how to, how to fund all kinds of things and very limited revenues. If we, they can pass Pitt and Robertson during the depths of the depression, we can figure out a way to bring some folks together in 2016, 2017 to get this done now. So I can't say enough about Jeff's leadership. I can't say enough about Dave's team at AFLA. Um, the state agencies are doing great work. We are going to build a conservation army around this thing. We've already kind of lined up 6,400 organizations in all the states to support this. Um, so there'll be a big kind of conservation push behind it. You will have all the support, all the cover, all the all the help that you need in your individual districts to make sure those groups are out there championing this. Um, but this is fiscally conservative. I mean, at the end of the day, if we can avoid impacts on, if we can avoid impacts on business, if we can avoid impact, uncertainty in the marketplace by investing in conservation, this price would be a very small, very small down payment on a massive return. So I do hope you'll recommend to your bosses that you'll support this. I do hope that the congressmen that are here will be considered being sponsors. But this is a huge opportunity to leave a great legacy and conserve thousands of species right now that frankly, as someone, as a father of a four-year-old daughter, I want to make sure my daughter has as much wildlife abundance and even more than I had growing up. I want to make sure I pay that forward. And with this legislation, we'll do just that. So thank you very much for supporting the Blue Ribbon Panel recommendations. Um, so we had this Blue Ribbon panel, which is a very diverse group of people uh, from, from pretty broad spectrum, looking at solutions to a, a looming issue that has been looming for way too long. And as every year goes past, the threat becomes more and more progressively worse uh, as to what can happen. And we just have to look at the sage grouse and see how expensive that whole exercise was to, to just give a recent indication of what we're talking about. So we formulated a legislative strategy. You heard Dave talk about where this number, uh, and let's be honest, the congressman knows $1.3 billion, even in Washington, is a lot of money. Uh, but but as, as Colin points out, this is, a, this is an investment, and that's the way we're going to approach it. That's the way we're going to ask for support from members of the House and the Senate to get behind this. We have legislative language um, that has been drafted. It is being vetted by Congressman Young, uh, who has offered to take the lead in the House. I think a lot of you remember his efforts at CARA, uh, so he was a fairly logical person to go back to. Uh, he enthusiastically said he would like to do it. There are just some tweaks. We heard from Congresswoman Dingell. She wants to take the lead uh, as the, the first Democrat co-sponsor on the, on the legislation. CSF is going to go to our leaders of the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus, try to gauge their level of support for this, um, talk to them about what we see is the importance of this from, from the sportsman's conservation community world. 
where there have been numerous meetings through teaming with wildlife and others in the Senate already. Uh, we have identified some, some folks that are looking like they will take the leadership role over there. So it is our intent to have legislation dropped in both the House and the Senate. Uh, and to reiterate, this is not a new tax. This is not new funding. This is coming off of existing revenue streams from offshore and, and onshore oil and gas uh, royalties that are already going into the Treasury. This is just putting them to work to be preemptive, get out in front of this looming issue. So yes, it'll require an offset. Uh, but again, Washington's pretty good at figuring out ways to offset things. Uh, they're very creative with their math. And so, but the real issue is it's no new money. Um, we're, not, we're not goring anybody else's ox at this point to try to get this done. So um, we think this is a, 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 a tangible goal. We think that this is something that can really, really significantly make a difference. Colin mentioned it. You know, hopefully 80 years from now, people will talk about what the Blue Ribbon Panel did what our leaders in Congress did to help protect uh, and conserve our wildlife resources for, for generations to come. So thank you all uh, for being here. I will give you, we've still got a few minutes, um, an opportunity if you have any questions uh, for, for any of the, uh, any of our panelists or any comments. I know looking around the room, there are a lot of people that have been working on this issue uh, longer than I have uh, that are definitely more versed in, in what are the pitfalls that we're no doubt going to have to run around